we've seen how a polaroid filter such as this one can filter uh, unpolarized light and make it polarized but there's another way to make polarized light and that's through reflection so to show that what we've got here is a laser and it's generating unpolarized light and it's reflecting off a glass block here and we get spots on the screen here behind me now the reason there are two spots instead of one is because this glass block has got a thickness and so we get a reflection off the front surface of the block and a reflection off the back surface of the block and so we end up with two spots here now, if I put my Polaroid filter in front of these two spots, so the beams are now passing through the uh, polarizing filter, and I rotate it, you can see that there is maybe a little bit of a difference in intensity, but really there's not much change in intensity. So now I'm going to alter the angle of reflection. Now, at this point, let's see what happens. Well, so I've got it at one angle, and you can see the uh, laser's getting through fine. But now, when I rotate it, the two points essentially disappear. There's a very tiny amount of light getting through. And that's because at this angle of reflection, the reflected light is almost entirely polarized. And in fact, if I accurately adjusted the angle to what is called Brewster's angle, named after David Brewster who discovered this effect, I would find that the reflected light was perfectly polarized. Now the transmitted light is only partially polarized. And the reason for that is that we don't reflect half the beam of light, we only reflect a small fraction of the beam, which is why we're using an intense source like a laser. And Although the reflected light is entirely polarized, the transmitted light contains both polarization states, but obviously less of the polarization state that's been reflected. So it's a, what we call a partially polarized refracted beam, but the reflected beam is perfectly polarized. Now, this is why, you know, if you're wanting to take pictures underwater, you want to use a Polaroid filter on your camera lens because the reflections from water will be filtered out because they're a polar, they generally tend to be polarized reflections. It's also why sunglasses are particularly effective if you're at the seaside because they will uh, filter out the polarized reflected glare of sunlight off the water. So to understand this a little bit more and show how to calculate uh, Brewster's angle, uh, let's have a look at some diagrams. So here we have a diagram of what we saw happening with the laser. We have the light coming in at an angle of incidence, and this angle of incidence is actually what is called Brewster's uh, angle. And what happens is we get a reflected beam, and this reflected beam is perfectly polarized, and the refracted beam is partially polarized. You can see here that this arrow in this direction is reduced in size because part of that uh, polarization state has been reflected here, so we get a partially polarized refracted beam. Now, at Brewster's angle, the reflected ray is at 90 degrees to the refracted ray. And if we have a look at the angle going around here, this is a straight line, so this has to be 180 degrees. And so what we can say is that the angle of reflection plus the angle of refraction must be equal to 90 degrees because we've got 180 here minus 90, which leaves 90 degrees. Now, the law of reflection, of course, tells us that Brewster's angle here is equal to the reflection angle because this is the angle of incidence. The law of reflection says angle of incidence equals angle of reflection. So I can rewrite this as theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees minus, and now instead of calling it theta r, it's going to be theta b. Okay, so that's for the reflection. What about the refraction now? Well, for refraction, we have Snell's law. And so we have that the sine of the angle of incidence, which is theta b in this case, divided by the sine of the angle of refraction, which is theta 2, is equal to n2 over n1, where we have uh, original medium with refractive index 1, and the new medium is refractive index 2. Now, if I rearrange this, then I'm going to have n1 sine theta b is equal to n2 times the sine of theta 2, 
but instead of using theta 2, I'm going to use this expression here. So that's 90 degrees minus theta b. Okay, so what's this value here? Well, let's draw a little right angle triangle here. So here's my right angle triangle, and this is going to be theta b, and so therefore this angle here is 90 minus theta b, 90 degrees minus theta b. Now, if I look at the sine of this angle, it's the opposite. So that's uh, this one here divided by um, uh, this, which is the hypotenuse. But if I look at the cosine of this angle, it's the same side here divided by the hypotenuse. So this is simply equal to n2 times the cosine of theta b. So, uh, and this is equal to n1 sine theta b. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the cosine down here, and I'm going to take n1 down here, and what I end up with is sine divided by cosine, which is the tangent, and this is n2 divided by n1. And so therefore, the Brewster's angle for this uh, uh, boundary between the two media is the inverse tangent of n2 divided by n1, where n2 is the refractive index of the new medium, and n1 is the refractive index of the medium the light is originally traveling through. And so this allows us to calculate Brewster's angle for the boundary between any two media. So we've now seen two ways that we can generate polarized light. The first is by using a filter, and the second is by using reflection. And this shows that the different polarization states of light can interact with materials in different ways. And there is, in fact, a particular class of material called birefringent materials, where the different polarization states of light actually have different refractive indices in the material. And this gives rise to several very useful phenomena. The first of these is when geologists are wanting to identify minerals in a rock sample, they take a rock sample, they slice it very thinly so it's transparent, and they put it between two cross polarizers, and then minerals that are birefringent will essentially twist the plane of the polarization of the light, and so that light can actually come through um, the cross-polarization plates, whereas normally if you don't have a birefringence there, because the polarization states are completely crossed, you get no light. And so this helps them identify the presence of particular minerals in a sample. The other application of birefringence is far more useful for engineers, and that's when you induce birefringence in a material by applying stress. And so let's have a look at an example of that. So what we've got here, you can see projected onto the screen, we've got an overhead projector and there's already one polarizer um, on the uh, top of the display. And on top of this, you can see this uh, piece of plastic here that is uh, just a piece of plastic that we're going to stress. And down here, you can maybe just make out a little piece of uh, sellotape. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a second polarizer and I'm going to put it on so that the angles of polarization between these two filters are at 90 degrees so you wouldn't expect any light to come through. And when we do that and the camera adjusts, you can see that almost everywhere the light is uh, almost entirely blocked except for this small region uh, down here where we have the uh, sellotape and that is because this material is naturally birefringent and it rotates the plane of the polarized light so that the light can actually uh, make it through here and you can also see it gives it a particular tint and that's because it does it differently for the different wavelengths and so there's a particular characteristic color. Now, you can see here that the, uh, the main piece of plastic just disappeared because it's not birefringent under normal conditions. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to stress the plastic. And when you do that, you can see that at points of stress, for example, around the corner, suddenly it allows light to come through. And that's because at the points of maximum stress, the material becomes birefringent, and so it twists the plane of the polarized light and allows the light to come through 
the crossed polars. And this is how you can measure stress in a material. If you can put it between two crossed polaroid filters, you can actually see the patterns of stress in the material. And of course, that can be very useful when uh, determining um, which areas of a structure you need to uh, reinforce or to confirm that you have actually calculated the uh, load points of a structure correctly. And so that's uh, one of the applications of polarized light in engineering. And so that's it for our discussion of the polarization of light. Uh, one of the effects we're going to look at next is called dispersion. Mm -hmm.